functional role in the environment. So what part do they play? So in the ocean, primary producers serve the way plants do on land. And they are what converts the sun's energy to, um, to food for the rest of the system. The next level is primary consumers. And those are known as dual plankton. And they're these mostly tiny little crustaceans that the secondary, tertiary, and top level consumers or predators, um, they underlie the rest of the sea life. So in the um, deep ocean, lanternfish are actually one, and they're also known as lanternfish, are one of the um, primary, secondary consumers that we're going to be talking about today. <laughs> and they make up most of the um, deep scattering. And if you didn't notice, there's an elephant seal up here because these are all fish consumers, but we also have marine animals. So we know less about top birds or predators and their predator prey interaction. And most of what we do know is um, from stomach content studies. So um, we know that there's a lot of species of these predators that are foraging on this mesopelagic deep ocean sea web. And we're starting to understand some of the relationships um, between these um, metophids with um, zooplankton and also uh, jellyfish and other gelatinous organisms in the system at this lower level. However, what these big predators are doing going from relatively shallow depths or from the surface in the case of marine mammals, and um, what they're eating down in the depths is really limited, has been limited to um, what we can see in their stomachs, and um, that can be very biased. Dietary strategies for top predators can roughly be divided between um, generalist, specialist, special species, and generalist species that have specialist individuals. So, going starting with um, generalists, and most, most sharks are thought to be generalists eating a wide variety of prey items. We have their total niche width for their population. And for, general, for generalist species, it means that they have a very wide niche width. And if they're a generalist individual for that entire species, they would also have very wide niche width. So basically, they'd be eating most of what the entire population is. There's a lot of overlap between the individual diet and the total population. For specialist species, such as the crabbing seal, which some people like saying they eat mostly krill, it, it is considered a specialist species. So it has a much narrower um, niche width for its diet. It has, it has basically specializing on one type of prey. And all the individuals within that species are doing pretty much the same thing. But top characters like our friend the sea otter here, can have a wide range, uh, a very um, broad generalist diet for the entire species, but each individual focuses on one type of prey. So they could focus on crabs or sea stars or urchins. And so that means that the amount of overlap each individual has with the population diet is, is much smaller. So then, one of the um, last things I want to bring up about the diet as a kind of general introduction is the fact that within a species, if the species is eating a broad range of things, the role of that predator in the ecosystem 
system can change based on what it's needed. So this is an example um, of a squid. And here is eating a Mexican fish. And here, courtesy of our friend in Bari, is eating a Babalashes fish, another type of deep ocean fish. Here is eating a Piscivorous uh, fish called a vital fish. And it's one of the top fish predators within the deep scattering layers of the deep ocean. And here it's eating another squid. So it is gradually, it is eating all across the food web. And so what that means is that depending on what it's eating, where and when, it can have differential effects on uh, what's going on in the food web. So if it's eating mostly big coated fish, it's eating low on the food web, and it's decreasing prey for other predators as you go up. But if it's eating other squid, it's actually decreasing predation on the lower species. So and it is changing its functional role based on what it's eating. And we suspect that other predators can also be eating. So marine top predators are also very wide ranging. They, thanks to biologic technology, we've come up with a lot of um, information about where they go across their environment, and many of them, including elephant seals, are have enormous ranges of thousands of kilometers, and they also um, use a lot of them show extended migratory behavior when they are foraging. But they also have a very large range depth-wise, so they are diving thousands upon thousands of meters. And so they're covering a huge amount of range over space horizontally and vertically as they're traveling through their environment. And so they could be doing different things and eating different things depending on where they are spatially and where they are feeding vertically. So I've mentioned the deep scattering layers a couple times now. So now I'm going to give you a little bit of detail about what exactly that is. So the deep scattering layers are um, called deep scattering layers because they are picked up by acoustic sonar, which scatters the sound when it's um, going through the water. And basically, these layers are made up of blue plankton, jellyfish, small, other small fishes like and small fish predators and squid. And they may have the um, primary food source at these deep depths. And it's been estimated that, it can, that the worldwide um, fish abundance in these deep scattering layers could be up to 7 to 10 million metric tons. So it's a lot of food if you can deep dive deep enough able to access it. These deep scattering layers have what's called what's known as diurnal migration. So the organisms during the daytime are at depth and they stay deep in the dark waters to avoid visual predators. And then in the nighttime they come, some of them come up to the surface to feed when it is dark and they also are still avoiding predation that way. So there is a very definite diagonal migratory behavior of the, uh, the um, fish and squid and other organisms in these uh, in these uh, deep scattering layers. So we know that marine mammals and other predators dive down to these layers, and we really haven't had a good idea of what exactly they're doing there and exactly what they're eating there. But we're starting to get some idea of that from some um, echo sounder data. So this shows the signatures of two dolphins feeding among the fish in, in a shallower scattering layer. So, 
Nordic elephant seals are one of these deep threaded, deep ocean threaders that exemplify all of the um, characteristics that I've been talking about. They have these wide, like, really long migrations. They, their foraging range encompasses the um, entirety of the eastern North, North Pacific Basin. <laughs> and so so this is showing animals that we've um, tagged over the years. So as they are foraging across this wide ocean, some of them are um, they're basically covering a lot of ground and the prey that they're accessing could be different in relation to where they are. So a little bit of life history about the northern elephant seal. So elephant seals, um, female elephant seals, which is all I'm going to be talking about today. Sorry, Sarah. <laughs> They have a, um, this is kind of a year in the life of an elephant seal, and it will uh, breed on land in um, January, February, and then have a shorter forage trip in which it goes out to sea to replenish its energy stores, and then it will come back to molt, and then it has a long foraging trip in which it is at sea gaining energy, recovering from the energy loss during Molt, but also um, just hating the pup at the same time. And so these two foraging trips are very seasonal in nature when it comes to what is going on in the ocean and prey that's available for them at that time. And so I am breaking convention and I'm going to be referring to these trips as the winter spring foraging trip and the summer fall foraging trip emphasize the seasonality of the um, migration and what's going on oceanographically and with the prey base at that time. So with the elephant seal people <laughs> So elephant seals um, as a whole have this very large foraging range, but individuals do show some um, special, well, I, I would call it specialization, but um, they have individual um, variations in their, um, in where they're going. So certain seals will tend to stay, um, we've in the past called this more coastal, but they go northward into the Gulf of Alaska, uh, Gulf of Alaska and others travel straight west from the colony and forage in what is um, from the transition zone. And I'll go more into the oceanography later. So um, I just want to emphasize here that certain individuals um, are existing evidence of particular foraging strategies in regards to where they go. And then you know, also show a very strong year-to-year um, -year fidelity to their particular foraging. So the blue track is from a seal that was tagged in um, 1998. And that same seal was accidentally tagged again 17 years later. And she has basically almost exactly the same track. And we've seen through other studies that this is actually fairly common for other seals to have this by site fidelity. So it seems that they have a foraging strategy and they stick to it. So this would suggest that possibly they could also do the same thing with their diet. They could pick something that they like to eat or they're eating something where they're going and they stick to that. So it suggested that there could be some specialization in diet. So the vertical diet behavior of elephants and seals um, is also really extreme. They basically dive continuously while they're at sea. Then these bottom dives are probably 
right around 600, 500 meters in the ocean. And they forage mostly at the bottom of their dives. And these red dots are um, jaw motion events that were taken from um, vital logging tags that track the movement of the jaw. And it's indicative of feeding behavior. And so they're having it, they're covering enormous ground and diving to these deep depths where the deep gathering layers are. And they're um, uh, feeding at the bottom of their dive. And they're also, they also display um, in the same patterns in their diving behavior as well. So this, these are two examples from two different individuals. And the thing I want to draw your attention is that this individual doesn't have that many shallow dives, so let me orient you. So what's the individual is a way of measuring the time of day when you're crossing multiple times. <coughs> so everything in the light blue is daytime dives, and everything in the dark is nighttime, and then the light purple is twilight or the crepuscular period. And dark depth is here, the surface is at the top, and um, this goes to about 1,500 meters deep. So you can see this field doesn't have that many, and these are foraging dives only. And again, I'll get into details about that, how we determine that these are foraging dives later. But um, there are very few shallow dives here, but this individual displays quite a few more. And this individual has quite a few foraging dives that are deeper than 1,000 meters. But this field you know, doesn't have any, really. So this again, um, this distinctive behavior between individuals may be associated with particular diets, and it may also be associated in particular with where they're going. So because seals have this strong um, distinct behavior in where they go spatially, they could, um, this could be reflective of where their prey is. Um, depending on whether they go to the north or to the west. So, we actually know, uh, when I started this project, we didn't know that much about um, elephant seal diets. There have been a couple of studies done, and they were stomach content studies, and they showed that as Dan said in his introduction, that elephant seals have over 60 plus to 60 percent of their diet as the subaquatic squids, and um, the, they have a smaller proportion of Helios fish, but not fish from the deep scattering layers, not from the deep ocean. These are all fish that are found close to the shore, and then. Um, Smaller amounts of crustaceans and um, elastic branch, which branches are sharks and rays. However, diet um, studies that are done through stuff looking at stomach content so are can be very biased. And the reason they they are is because it, we can only measure what we can still find in the stomach. So hard um, objects that uh, don't digest, like cookies and fish obelisks, will stay um, in the stomach, whereas soft body organisms like jellies and um, and such will just dissolve and won't be there. <coughs> However, with um, fish like the tophus from the deep scattering layer, these fish are actually quite small and very fragile. So this is an example of how small these obelisks from um, deep ocean fish can be, and you can literally crush them with the side of a scalpel, so they won't survive well. In addition, as Dan said, elephant seals can fast for up to a few weeks before they actually arrive back on land. So if you're measuring what's on their stomach when they're on land, there's not much there to even look at. And then...
And then the other thing that um, biases diet studies is the fact that um, elephant seals are fasting when they come in. Um, if they do eat anything on their way in, it's likely to be opportunistic and would be um, not be reflective of the diet of when they're eating far off um, in the ocean. So basically, what I wanted to find out is what elephants are eating overall, but also is their diet related to their foraging habitat? Does it differ in terms of uh, where they're going in the uh, spatially um, in the horizontal? So if they're traveling up towards Alaska versus out to the transition zone. And does diet um, vary um, compared to um, in relation to the patterns that we see for um, their guiding them. So, chapter one um, is looking at the population level diet, and that's looking at it perspective, irrespective of where they go and um, and and, and, uh, and it's for season two. So um, it's basically what, what the entire population as a whole is. And then and for chapter two, I want to look, I'm going to tell you about the spatial and temporal differences in diets, uh, uh, in diet and the spatial, in particular, the horizontal where they are going in the ocean. And then for chapter three, I'm going to look at how the vertical diet behavior and patterns in vertical diet behavior uh, in space are influencing diet composition. So, for chapter one, offending a dietary paradigm for means of flesh predator with quantitative fatty acids. Analysis. So the main question here again: what are, what are elephant seals eating? Do they display individual specialization in diet? And can we use this method to determine the diet for a, a predator that has many potential prey, but very little prior knowledge in which to narrow down? What they may be. So, however, this is the question which consumes so much of my time, and it's all about statistics, uh, the model statistics, and the um, the um, diagnostics of whether or not we could actually distinguish prey and whether or not the model was predicting um, certain prey items accurately and I'm not going to um, go into all of those details today but if you want to know about this come find me I might be happy to talk about it <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so as I said, um, so previous study studies have said that elephant seals are super specialists. But there's actually quite a bit of evidence that we have that kind of hinted that that wasn't the case. The first thing was that um, we started getting video evidence from our Japanese colleagues from head mounted cameras that actually showed. Um, elephant seals encountering prey in the depths of the ocean, and there were a lot more encounters with fish than there were with. And so this is just an example of a single side view of the um, deep ocean, and this is 
a McTopin here, and this is what's called a bathalagid uh, bath fish. And these are both fish that, um, uh, they're actually um, the most prevalent in the deep scattering layers, both of those um, families. Then we knew that southern elephant seals from um, doing chemical analyses, both cytoisotopes and fatty acids, that they actually ate a majority of fish. And they are very similar to their sister species, the northern elephant seal, um, in both their migration um, length and the depth of their size. So we would suspect that if southern elephant seals are eating a lot of fish, that possibly northern elephant And um, the other thing that made us suspicious was the lack the diversity that is in the deep scattering layers. There is a lot of fish and a lot of different types of fish, and the fact that they would be um, specializing on squid um, didn't quite seem right in light of the high biomass and the high diversity of fish in those deep scattering layers. And also the relative energy density of prey made us um, question that, and I'll get to that in a second. So, as I was saying, I wanted to kind of give you guys an idea of what the diversity in the deep ocean is like, and also kind of some of the species that we saw in our, in our nets to um, for diet analysis. And so um, we have the dual plankton boards up here, the bathalagins and the, and the um, mectophids. We have um, fish that specialize on gelatinous creatures, like this um, uh, barrel eye fish. Um, we have generalist deep predators, like this fang tooth. These, um, this is a, a fake, uh, a viper fish, and this is a barracudina. And so, all of these are in the deep scattering layers where elephant seals are foraging and are potential prey. And I'll talk a little bit now about the squid. Um, so, there are vertically migrating muscular squid that they encounter or could encounter, and um, these guys tend to be a lot bigger. And they're active predators, so they will um, chase down um, their prey and would probably be fairly difficult to catch themselves. And then there are the non migrating gelatinous squids, like Chiroteuthis or Chaonius. And so these tend to have more um, gelatinous bodies and they're hidden weight predators. So they'll just kind of hang out and fish with their tentacles and they're just kind of sitting there in the water column waiting. waiting So, um, looking at the differential energy content of the spray, migrating fish like mycophids can have 10,000 to 15,000 kilojoules of energy per kilogram. However, they're very small. Um, non migrating fish tend to be a little bit less, though, so, about half as much um, in their energy content. Squids, while they're bigger, they have a uh, migrating squid are actually not very energy dense. They only have about 3,000 to 4,000 kilojoules per kilogram. So while you might think that going after a big prey would be more beneficial and you get more calories, the amount of energy it would take for the amount of energy per kilogram to um, down and catch one of these vertically migrating squid would probably not be that energy efficient for an elephant seal. However, um, the non migrating squid, like I said, who just kind of hang out in the water column, while they have a lower um, energy um, content than, say, the um, mixophids up here, they are just hanging out there. So if you encounter one, it would be really beneficial to just kind of gobble it up. 
So, other, um, when I was talking about the fact uh, uh, that the biases against stomach content analysis, there are some biochemical methods of determining diet which have been used recently. And one is looking at stable isotopes and um, differences in stable isotope ratios in animal tissue. One is looking at, uh, one, you can look at DNA um, of uh, prey items that are in the scat and actually um, get down to the species level. And then there's fatty acid analysis. So all of these methods have some, have benefits and drawbacks. But one of the benefits of fatty acid analysis is that it integrates diet over a fairly long period of time. And, and so it will give us the diet from elephant seal over its um, trip. And it can give us species level um, quantification of what seals are eating. So, a little bit about fatty acids. And the paradigm here is can you are what you eat. So, um, a fatty acid is a uh, fat molecule that um, is. is um, organized into these large molecules called triacylglycerols or tags. And so those tags are in a specific, um, are in the tissues of the prey that's eaten when the elephant seal or whatever predator eats it, goes down into the stomach. And then for marine mammals um, like pinnipeds who have a large um, blubber layer, those um, molecules are broken down and then stored in the blood layer for thermal regulation and also to give them a stored energy once they're on the, um, when they go on land to um, either give birth or to molt. And when they're on land, they fast. So over the course of their trip, they go out skinny and they eat a lot. So they're taking a lot of these triacylglycerols. And they build up the fat layer here. And so basically what they're doing is storing a record of what they're eating in their blood. I just wanted to say one more thing here. Uh, so what we do with fatty acid analysis is we we have to have a library of prey where we have the uh, fatty acids, what we call signature or profile. So fatty acids are um, there in different um, uh, proportions for different prey items. And we can use the two-thousand model to, um, to figure out what diet is by comparing it to what the profile of the Okay, so for sampling for elephant seals, we had uh, 155 adult female seals that we got blubber samples from when they returned from their foraging trips. And this is for both post breeding, so the um, uh, winter spring trip and the post molt in, in the summer fall. We had the years, uh, we had seals in the years 2005 to 2006. And 2009 to 2012, we knew where these seals went based on um, their satellite tags that we deployed upon them, and um, we took the blubber biopsy for the lipid analysis using a small, um, minimally invasive So, um, this is a map of the sampling locations of where we collected. Right in relation to where 16 seals were tracked concurrently while we were at sea. And we were able to modify our ship's track in order to overlap with where elephant seals were foraging. But no, we didn't see any elephant seals while we were there. They're not on the surface very often. So while we were at sea, um, we just we had four water holes, two at night and two during the day. 
We also collected vertically migrated squid using um, something called a squid fit. We collected a total of 451 different prey types, 39 different fish species, and 12 different squid species. And um, we processed all of those species to get a uh, fat So, for um, the fatty acid profile, uh, for the um, model, we found out, and this is one of the details I'm not going to go into, that you must have more uh, fatty acids in your analysis than you have to have, uh, that you have prey, otherwise you would get the wrong answer. So, for a lot of diagnostic and statistical um, Modeling, we were able to um, narrow our final prey library to 41 species. And so um, we were able to um, draw 10 species that we were able to statistically determine were probably not being eaten by other species. And so if you're interested in how we did that, please see me in a very specific way. So we also had to um, develop a what's called a calibration coefficient. And that's to um, take into account any metabolic changes that happen from when the elephant seal ingests its prey and breaks it down and then transports its fatty acids uh, fast and triglycerol to the plumber. And um, for a um, predator like the elephant seal, there's not a lot of um, uh, metabolic changes that take place, but there is a little, and we have to account for that. So um, we had a water cell uh, sample from a captive female elephant seal, and 18 uh, samples each of capelin and herring, which were from her diet, and from that we were able to determine um, a calibration coefficient for each fatty acid that allowed us to make that transformation to account for any metabolic changes. Um, we estimated individual diets for each elephant seal um, using this model. And um, basically what it does is it takes the profile in the prey library and comes up with different combinations of them and compares it to the fatty acid profile of the, each individual Predator in the analysis and comes up with um, the most likely diet um, based on um, that combination of prey. And then we also looked at diet specialization for each animal using what's called the proportional similarity index. And basically, that's it's a scale from zero to one and it's measuring the overlap an individual diet um, with the population diet. So if you get a value based on um, the diet composition of an individual that does not overlap with the um, population average diet very much, you'll get a number very close to one, and that would indicate that an animal is specializing in relation to the uh, population. And uh, if you get a value plus one it means that the um, animal is eating uh, by a very similar to what the population is. Um, in terms of diet, we classified all of the prey in terms of their migrating and their um, diet, their migrating behavior and their diet yield to kind of um, get an idea of where in the um, in the trophic web that they were feeding. So um, we had 11 different functional groups based on these criteria. We had surface migrating um, zoo planktivores and surface migrating planktivores. We had midwater migrating uh, zoo planktivores and planktivores. Bathy midwater means bathy pelagic. Uh, midwater migrators, which means that um, these fish are very deep in the ocean during the 
day, and when they migrate, they're not migrating to the surface, they're migrating into the mesopelagic twilight zone. And so um, we had several species that display that behavior, and then we had um, a variety of non migrating species in all groups, plus this one lone thing, which is a true generalist. For squid, we had two groups, which were the vertically migrating and the non migrating squid, which I thought. Um, so, for our results, the big finding was that fish dominated the diet of um, the population level diet for elephant seals. They um, were over 53% of the average diet, and squid were only about 36%. So, in this figure, all of the blues and greens are fish in the diet, and then all of these here in the red are squid. The ones that are um, represented in very small quantities are the vertically migrating squid. And the um, ones here, we have three species of non migrating squid that came out in the diet. So they were not eating squid, it just wasn't the majority of their diet the way stomach contents uh, analysis had shown. Um, for fish, we had uh, 25 fish represented, and the surface migrating to the and the um, non migrating um, pisciforts were the two most common groups. And these fish were what we suspected they would be eating based on dieting behavior, and these are the ones that are encompassing the high energy rich recovery. These fish, on the other hand, are um, the kind of stay in the um, they don't migrate up during the day, and they explain some of the deep dieting behavior of other individuals even at night. So, so basically, um, this is a very broad general diet that includes a lot of species, um, 33 prey for the population. And so we said, are they, like, we can answer now, are they a specialist species like the crab in the field? And the answer is no. They are generalists. So looking at individual diet specialization, the um, uh, individual elephant fields themselves were actually mostly generalists as well. So this wasn't a, uh, a case of a broad diet with specialized individuals. Um, most individuals had a um, PSI value of over 0.5, which indicated that they were generalists, and their diet closely mirrored that of the um, population diet. We did, however, have a few individuals over here on this side who were specialists and had a very low overlap with the population diet, but they weren't very common at all. So we could then answer the question, are they are elephant seals a um, generalist species with specialist individuals? And the answer is also no. They are specialists. Um, generalists for the population and as individuals. So the big points from chapter one um, are that non-migrating squid were present in the diet because they were only a third of, of the average population diet. And so elephant seals were not squid specialists as we had believed based on some content studies. Um, energy rich species like nectosids um, are a critical primary source and elephant seals are not specialists either as species or as individuals. So after answering the questions of chapter one, I wanted to dig deeper and see, okay, are there differences in diet spatially 
orally and temporally. Um, uh, where, uh, in regards to where elephant seals are foraging horizontally in their habitat. So that leads to chapter two, and um, looking at spatial, seasonal, and intra-annual diet differences for elephant seals. However, for the purposes of this talk, um, which is already too long, is uh, that I'm not going to be talking about the intra-annual differences in diet here. But we did find a lot of intra-annual differences in diet that appear to be um, possibly linked to ocean climate variability. So, um, if you want to hear more about that, please come talk to me. I'd love to talk to you. Uh, so, the main questions that I'm going to talk about today are does diet differ depending on where seals go? And does it differ depending on the season of the foraging trip? And again, I'm not going into this. So, now I get to talk about, a bit about the oceanography of the northeastern Pacific Ocean where elephant seals are foraging. And um, basically, the northeastern Pacific has this strong subarctic gyre, which is a cooler water mass, and the tropical gyre, which tends to be warmer. And this gyre boundary and the mixing of these waters is known as the transition zone. Now, elephant seals forage across that area. So there are two um, main oceanographic features that structure the um, deep scattering layers uh, and, and where they're located in the ocean. So the oxygen minimum zone <laughs> areas, so like permanent areas of very low oxygen availability. And um, in the northeastern Pacific up here, you can see that um, in the subarctic, the shallow uh, boundary of the um, oxygen minimum zone is very close to the surface, where in the more central Pacific here, it's much deeper. And in the California current, there's also a very shallow oxygen minimum now, um, probate and the deep scattering layers use the oxygen minimum zone to escape from visual predators that also have high oxygen requirements, like predatory fish that are very fast moving and need to get a lot of the oxygen out of the water from their gills. However, we're hiding out in the oxygen minimum zone that doesn't really benefit <coughs> from an elephant seal who is carrying this component on board. So these, uh, this, the oxygen minimum zone for elephant seals serves to concentrate or um, prey uh, where they can feed on it. And light attenuation influences this by um, the fish also trying to avoid light in the water column as well. And so in an area like the um, subarctic Pacific, Light coming down from above and a shallow oxygen minimum zone can serve to concentrate um, fish in the scattering layers at certain depths. So, um, in the past year or two years, really, two, uh, a few studies have come out that have. Um, basically um, divided the uh, regions the elephant seals forage in into what are um, known as biogeographic provinces. And they have made these delineations based on um, uh, areas with similar oceanographic um, features and also having similar um, uh, uh, faunal components type of, of fish and squid that are present there. And so um, these have been done for surface water, and I'm sure some of you have heard of the long for provinces, but these have specifically been done for the use of the now and are a useful tool when looking at broad 
scale differences in habitat um, that the elk and seals are encountering upon their um, migration. And the oxygen minimum zones um, have distinct characteristics, as I mentioned before, depending on whether you're in the subarctic Pacific, the North Central Pacific, or the California. So um, the methods for this will be simpler because we're just um, building on what we did for chapter one. So um, for looking at the horizontal um, spatial differences in diet, uh, we had 131, so a subset of our 155 fields that we had pair tracking and diet data for. And we actually had a narrow down Years. So I, you probably don't remember, but 2009 was included before, and now it is not included because there were only three seals in 2009 that we actually had tracking data for. And um, the diet composition, so we used the diet compositions that were determined by 2000 in the previous chapter. Again, we had 11 prey functional groups, and um, the three, we classified seals to the Selection by geographic provinces. And we did that based on how much of their time they spent in each of those provinces, which we were able to gain from the satellite tracks. So, um, time for elephant seals is a useful proxy for foraging since we've shown that they slow down um, in their um, tracks um, when they're uh, having high foraging success. So, if an animal spent over 50% of its time here in the subarctic Pacific, like this green seal, is classified as a subarctic Pacific forager, and if it was in the North Central Pacific, a North Central Pacific forager, and so on. Um, if it didn't really spend most of its time in any particular forage, uh, foraging province, then it's classified as a mixed spatial strategy, but I'm not going to really talk about this. So, in order to see if diet composition um, differed uh, due to which province they were foraging in and what season and what year, we used three factors from ANOVA using price for similarity in this in, uh, matrices on the diet compositions, and we used post hoc fertilized tests. On the significant factors to determine which groups within each of those were actually different from each other. And then we used an analysis called canonical analysis of principal coordinates to um, see which functional groups were um, driving the differences between these groups. And CAP analysis is very similar to a um, uh, a uh, to other multivariate analyses that um, condense um, multivariables so that you can look at them together. However, it's particularly useful to be able to test um, uh, specific hypotheses. And then um, for the, we also, from the canonical analysis, we calculated a person's correlation coefficient, and that was to determine which of the prey functional groups were, um, were driving the relationship to the Okay, so this is an example of um, this is um, output from the CAP analysis to show the differences in um, diet between fields. Um, Working in different provinces during the winter spring. I'm going to kind of walk you through this figure because it's a little complicated. So each um, each uh, dot is an elephant seal in the analysis, and um, the diets of subarctic Pacific seals in green and um, North Central Pacific seals in blue, and the uh, California current purple were all significantly different from each other. 
and the um, overlying correlation coefficients are showing which functional groups are driving the differences um, between those um, spatial strategies. So, for example, the field that is here uh, for G in the subar Pacific has more non migrating squid in its diet than more surface uh, migrating for plantivore than a uh, field foraging in the uh, more central Pacific that is feeding more on non migrating isovores, non migrating for plantivore, and um, migrating squid. Okay, so, um, and I'm going to break this down so it's easier for you to see what the differences are in a bit. So, in the summer fall, um, the subarctic Pacific still was had seal foraging in the subarctic Pacific were still different from seal foraging in the North central Pacific, but um, there was no longer a uh, difference from the um, Fields for strength. And the California current fields, all three of them, were uh, had different diets, but it was mainly being um, driven by this one non migrating generalist that was in the diet of one field. So I'm a little suspicious about this. Okay. So for seals foraging during the winter spring, in the subarctic Pacific, where the oxygen minimum zone is shallow and very thick, they had high amounts of non migrating squid in their diet and high amounts of surface uh, migrating fish. But they had very low amounts of the um, uh, non migrating. Uh, fish in their diet. So, um, the um, seals that forage in the North Central Pacific, where the oxygen minimum zone is deeper and, and much thinner, have low amounts of surface migrating fish and high amounts of um, non migrating fish. So, basically, seals in the North Central we're focusing on the upper layer of the oxygen minimum zone, which is concentrating the amount of um, surface migrating fish towards the surface. And um, because the oxygen minimum zone is so deep, sometimes even deeper than elephant seals are diving, the non migrating fish are um, not, as, uh, not as efficient for them to go after them because they're present in the diet. Uh, in much lower amounts. Whereas in the North Central Pacific, they have um, the, the lower oxygen minimum zone, there's more room for the surface migrating fish to disperse in the water column, and elephant seals um, are not able to focus on that highly concentrated layer like they are in the subarctic Pacific, and thus there are less. Um, surface migrating fish in their diet and more non And in the California current, which has also has a uh, shallow oxygen minimum zone, it has um, intense upwelling during the winter and spring. And because of the similarities in where the oxygen minimum zone is located, their diets were actually very similar to the um, silver. So in the summer fall, when the seasonal oxygen minimum zone in the um, subarctic Pacific is less intense and uh, becomes more oxygenated, those surface migrating fish are not um, concentrated at the top, they're not limited anymore, they can go deeper. And so the um, surface migrating zooplanktivores uh, in the diet. Uh, are no longer a factor in the differences between seals uh, that are foraging up there and seals that forage in the North Central Pacific. 
wind is still pretty high and the guys um, uh, still foraging in the subarctic and there are more now migrating fish and so um because that forage in the um more central pacific still ate less with and they had still quite a lot of now migrating fish and a relative difference between the amounts of um now migrating fish in the diet for subarctic pacific foraging fields and more central pacific fields um were what appears to be driving the differences in diet between these two um to this season and in the california current um uh, upwelling supplies during the summer and fall and the diets are now different from the um, diet field portion in the subarctic the surface migrating fish remain high in their diet throughout the year and with the um, uh, supplies of upwelling and other undercurrent factors, non migrating fish become more important in the diet of California current seals during this season. So, um, looking at differences in diet specialization across problems. So, although there, uh, as a whole, there isn't much diet specialization for northern elephant seals, they um, do have a range of values, and I'm interested in whether or not the degree of specialization was different between seals foraging in different provinces. And what I found was not really. So, there was a significant relationship. Um, uh, difference between seals that forage in the subarctic Pacific in the winter spring, um, with them having a slightly, um, slightly more special, uh, higher degree of specialization. But I think it's mostly being driven by this animal here, who is kind of the one, uh, one of two kind of extreme specialists in the diet, and there was much more variation in the degree. Uh, specialization across provinces uh, between the subarctic Pacific fields and the North Central Pacific fields. But overall, there wasn't that much of a difference. And there was no difference in the degree of specialization in diet between seals foraging in different provinces during the summer and fall. So, Overall conclusions is that um, diet differences um, were matched, but we were expecting based on the location of the oxygen minimum zone and how that was influencing um, how that influences the deep scattering layers in the deep ocean. And in the summer fall, when the oxygen minimum zone in the subarctic is high, so does that um, very strong diet difference. Uh, difference between seals that forage in the subarctic and seals that are foraging mostly in the central Pacific. And that the degree of individual specialization for seals foraging in different provinces was not So, um, so that uh, wraps up the spatial and seasonal differences of elephant seal diet and before and how diet relates to um, changes in horizontal foraging behavior across space. But um, then I wanted to look at how it changed and what the relationship was with um, where uh, seals were diving and foraging vertically in their environment. So, vertical foraging strategies um, reflect the spatial differences in diet. So, my main questions were, does the foraging diet behavior reflect the spatial differences in diet 
bias that we saw from northern elephant sales in chapter two, and does that match with the distribution that um, we expect uh, that the broad scale distribution of the scattering layer spatially? And I also looked at whether the degree of individual bias specialization was related to poor genetic behavior and whether seals. Um, that ex exhibited high site fidelity to their spatial um, foraging area also were more specialized in their diet. So coming back to this, so um, I was this actually kind of precipitated my entire thesis. So I was interested whether these dieting, individual dieting patterns that we saw um, with the um, shallow, mid, and deep dives and the relative differences between individuals was related to what they were, what each individual was eating and whether that was associated with um, difference uh, in where they were um, or in which bias you were from. So we use another subset of seals, uh, 122 of the original 155 that we had paired dieting, tracking, and diet data for. Um, we have the same year as the diet for the two thousand model, the proportional similarity index that we already calculated, and the dieting behavior that we selected from five thousand quarters that were deployed on seals during the migration. So and this is just um, showing again all the seals that were in our study and where they went. And for this um, chapter, I decided to um, focus on the three most important um, functional groups in the diet, which and the ones that were most likely to be linked to differences in the vertical foraging behavior. So the surface migrating to a plankton board, which I'll probably refer to often as Fish, and then the two not the non-migrating isomorphs and non-migrating squid. So, in order to look at dive behavior, we first had to find every dive an elephant seal took on its um, trip to a dive uh, to a dive type that has a putative behavior associated with it. So, um, this is example of different foraging dives and these ones that have a lot of wiggle active are, are called active bottom and are, are um, thought to be foraging dives and then also from uh, we know that these long v-shaped deep dives are also foraging dives and we know this from the shell motion events that were recorded by the uh, shell motion accelerometer that have been deployed by our um, Japanese colleagues. So we only analyzed foraging dives for this um, chapter, and each of those foraging dives was classified to a biogeographic province based on um, a dive track that basically geolocated each dive to where the seal was stationary. And then all dives were assigned to day, night, and twilight using a zenith angle, and then we used an optimal cleaning clustering on the dive depth of the forge dives to see uh, to um, look at patterns in um, forge dive depth for both day, night, and twilight. So one of the things we uh, also wanted to look at was what was driving the variability in foraging dive depth. And um, we used a variance component analysis um, and ran, with a random effects model in order to see if most of the variation was due to where the dive took place, so the dive location, or to individual variability. And then we looked 
at um, the Queen's Province differences in foraging diet depth and use ANOVA on the proportion of gay foraging dyes. And we looked at it within province relationships between diet in terms of the proportion of the three important functional groups and foraging diet depth using uh, linear regression models by province. And we also looked at individual diet specialization um, and tested for relationships Forage diet depth and the degree of diet specialization by diet location. So um, we first uh, looked, wanted to quantify the variation in the forage diets that we could see by individuals. So this is a showing. All of the day, uh, all of the foraging guides by all of the seals in the study, and using transparency, you can still see those patterns that we saw in individuals with sound guides uh, and very deep guides. The very, very deep guides are hard to see here because of the transparency. Um, not a lot going on in, in the twilight guides, but there's all, there is some stratification in the um, night dives, but it shows that um, classic diagonal pattern shallow, shallower at night, deeper during the day. Um, when we ran the optimal training cluster analysis on the dive depth for base foraging dives, there were three optimal clusters a shallow, shallow in relation to the elephant field stone, anyway, with a mean around 400 meters a mid-depth cluster, and a very uh, a deep dive cluster. And so um, there were no clusters, or one cluster for twilight um, dives, and there is a 29 clusters identified from the, um, the analysis for um, night dives. And since the... the um, the reason for the very extreme variation in nighttime dives, I believe, is due to um, differential rates of migration, by uh, dive migration by um, different um, fish in the migrating in the deep scattering layer, how it differ from province to province, and um, how species differ in the depths. Some migrate all the way to the surface, others don't, and so all that variation together is combining to give a, a very, um, a lot of variation in the in terms of where elephant seals are diving at night when you group them all together. The other thing we found is that 95% of the variance that we see in the foraging dive depth for both day and night is due to where that dive took place, so what side of the geographic province it occurred in, and very little was due to um, individual variability. So, um, I wanted to look at how these, spatially, how these dives, uh, foraging dives, differed by province, and if that related to some of the differences that we saw in diet. So, if you'll remember in the Arctic Pacific, they were eating more surface migrating through planktivores. So, I expected that they would have more uh, shallow dives in the subarctic Pacific than they would in the North Central Pacific, where um, the migrating fish were not as much of a factor in diet. And so, just looking at the data, we were able to see that exact pattern there. In the subarctic uh, Pacific, here at the top, there were a lot of shallow dives in the North Central Pacific. There were very uh, few relatively uh, shallow foraging dives. In the winter, spring in the subarctic Pacific, when there's that very deep oxygen um, minimum zone, there are much fewer um, of the deep of the foraged dives in the deep cluster, and the ones that aren't uh, deep 
are varying as compared to when that oxygen layer is going to dissipate in the summer fall. And then in the California current, where we knew that non migrating fish were not as much of a factor in the winter spring, there was uh, visibly less deep dives, um, which would correlate with what we expected. So I tested those relationships that we can see using ANOVA and basically found um, that in the um, winter spring, that seals in the submarket Pacific had um, uh, significantly more um, shallow dives than, than those in the North Central Pacific and uh, those in the California current did as well, but they were not different from each other. And mid foraging dives were the most common dives among each uh, during both seasons. And so um, this correlates with kind of that upper boundary again of the oxygen minimum zone. And then uh, the, very, the deep dive in the um, uh, subarctic Pacific were significantly less than the number of deep dives in the North Central Pacific. And we would expect there to be more deep dives in the North Central Pacific because of the uh, shallower oxygen minimum zone and um, the deeper location. So most of those seals are diving much deeper in order to get food. Um, during uh, the summer fall, um, there is no difference in the number of deep dives between the North Central Pacific and the uh, um, Subarctic Pacific. And California current just has very few deep dives. So, looking at the relationship specifically between diet and the composition, uh, the frequency of the three important functional groups and diet behavior for, uh, for seal diving in provinces. Um, so, where they were, where were they were foraging? Um, basically, for the uh, for looking at shallow dives. Since so few dives occurred in the North Central Pacific, so few shallow dives occurred, less than 2% of foraging dives um, occurred. Less, for seals foraging in the North Central Pacific, less than 2% of all their foraging dives were actually shallow dives, so we couldn't even look at the relationship there because there were so few dives. Um, so we just looked at the um, subarctic Pacific and California current, and we found very distinct relationships between the uh, proportion of uh, shallow foraging dives and the proportion of um, all three functional groups in, in the diet. So more, uh, if a seal had more shallow foraging dives, then they had more uh, surface migrating fish in their diet and more uh, more non-migrating squid, and they had less non-migrating squid. So the pattern match is exactly what we would expect based on um, where we would expect the, the scattering layer to be in the provinces. So we looked at in the summer fall, the relationship between um, the uh, amount of shallow dives and the amount of non-migrating, surface migrating fish and non-migrating fish in the diet disappear, which is what we would expect in the dissipation of the oxygen minimum zone in the subarctic Pacific. It also disappears from the California current, and that could have to do with the, um, the uh, supply needs of the um, uh, the intense upwelling during the summer fall. And the one relationship that persisted was that for um, non migrating squid. And um, so in the summer fall, for seals in the subarctic Pacific, there was still a strong relationship between, um, a strong positive relationship between the proportion of shallow 
died a seal had and um, the amount of migrating. So for the um, winter spring, for looking at mid-depth dives, there was a relationship in the proportion of mid-depth dives and the proportion of surface migrating to plankton boards, so the surface migrating fish and non-migrating to again. In this case, as the amount of um, mid-depth dives increased, the amount of both of those functional groups decreased. And that was in the Samarctic Pacific and the Southern Current, but not for seals in the North Pacific. In the summer fall migration, um, again, those relationships with um, surface migrators and non migrating fish um, went away, and the only relationship that persisted was the negative relationship between the depth dives and non migrating. So, looking at deep dives, um, in the California current, there were so few deep dives, less than 5% of all cork sites in deep, so they, again, could not be analyzed for this. But in the winter spring, in the subarctic Pacific, there, um, if a seal had more deep dives, then it was. Um, it was feeding more migrating, uh, excuse me, more non migrating fish. But there was not a relationship between um, surface migrating uh, fish or non migrating squid for either of those provinces. In the summer fall, there were no significant relationships between the number of deep or deep dives and the um, uh, amount of either any of those. Uh, in the diet. So then we also looked at the relationship between the degree of individual diet specialization and the um, proportion of uh, shallow, mid depth, and deep forage diet. And the only um, province in the winter spring that had a relationship. Um, was the Arctic Pacific, and with its uh, increase in shallow foraging dive behavior, there was an increase in the degree of dive specialization. And then in the summer fall, that relationship was still evident for shallow dives in the Arctic Pacific, and it was also evident for um, shallow dives that occurred in the um, California current as well. And then uh, for mid depth dives, the seals in the California current only, as they increased their the amount of um, mid depth foraging dives, they, their um, dive specialization actually decreased. So that they became more, they were more likely to. So now I'm going to kind of pull it all together because I know there's a lot of information to kind of synthesize over um, all of the chapters and it's going to combine and it's integrating the diving and the, the differences in diet between both the spatial, so three biogeographic provinces, and the depth of which um, fields are diving at. So basically, in the subarctic during the winter spring, again, we have that deep oxygen minimum zone, and it, it is very shallow, and with the light coming down from above, it concentrates that much fat, those surface migrating, these scattering layers um, up at the top where elephant seals can kind of nail them. And then the um, oxygen minimum zone is so thick that at the bottom um, is many times could be at the very extreme of where elephant seals will die to forage, and um, so it may not be as energy efficient for them to do that. 
So what we saw for seals that forage primarily in the North Pacific was that they ate more um, surface uh, migrating fish. They ate less um, non-migrating fish, and they ate more um, uh, non-migrating squid. And when we looked at their behavior, their their diving behavior, we also saw that that, that seals that ate more non-migrating fish also had shallower dives. Seals that ate more non-migrating squid counterintuitively also had more shallow dives. And I and a possible reason for this could be that um, with this intense oxygen minimum zone. Um, and the concentrated prey layer at the top that these deeper migrating squid in uh, that we normally think of as being below about 500 meters in the water column um, may actually be coming up closer to the surface even during the daytime to feed on these hyper concentrated prey layers. And so that might be why we see a similar relationship, which is kind of the opposite to what I expected. Um, for dysfunctional groups. And then for the subarctic Pacific, we also saw very few deep dives that we, and so that correlated again with what we saw in diet in that province. Now for the North Central Pacific, we saw uh, we have a deeper overall oxygen minimum <coughs> zone, much thinner oxygen minimum zone in general, uh, because the light is um, there's not as much compression of the, um, the, the migrating the scattering layer here. They have more room to kind of spread out in, and still be in darkness to um, avoid um, visual predators. Um, we saw that they had um, less surface migrating fish in their diets, and um, that also <laughs> correlated with very few shallow dives because the prey doesn't even concentrate at that 300 meter mark the way it is in the market. And then we saw that there was much more non migrating fish species in the diet of seals that primarily forage in the North Central Pacific. And um, we would expect that because we're going to dive um, deep to get the surface migrators. There's not as much energy to be expended going down to the deeper um, interface of the oxygen minimum zone because it is much thinner. And then in the California current, we have again a shallow oxygen minimum zone, which is very similar to that seen in the Southern Pacific and explains why there's a diet difference in the fields that primarily forms between the Arctic and the California. So they had similar amounts of non-migrating um, fish in their diet. Um, in the uh, winter spring in the California current, there's actually um, oftentimes not even a deep, a, a kind of uh, very deep scattering layer to be seen. And so that again can explain why there is um, very low um, non migrating fish in the diet, and why we saw so few deep foraging dives of elephant seals in that province. So, um, so, in the summer fall, when this um, oxygen minimum zone kind of alleviates and, and becomes much less prevalent in the subarctic Pacific. The dives between seals that are forging in the subarctic Pacific are <coughs> no longer as um, different in terms of the amount of surface migrating fish that they're eating. Um, there is still a difference in the diet, but it's most mainly due to um, proportional differences in the amount of non migrating species that are in their diet. So it's less to do with um, uh, with differences between the functional groups for the season. And then in the California current, seals that um, are foraging here, 
there is now a um, a lower a lower boundary scattering layer of deep migrating fish, and those fish actually do so often for a field to the south. So, in conclusion, um, we saw that uh, foraging dives um, had Escape vertical clusters that were um, likely due to spatial differences in prey distribution. During the winter spring, the, there was a distinct cluster of shallow dives in the subarctic that was associated with more surface migrating fish in the diet. And the summer fall relationships were only evident in the subarctic Pacific. And for individual diet specialization, the only relationship we, we saw between um, diet behavior. And um, how specialized a seal tended to be was in the Arctic Pacific. And we saw that shallow diving um, specialists may be targeting specific migrating fish species. But um, that relationship actually surprised me, so I'd like to look into that more in the future. And so, um, final thoughts. Are that elephant seals appear to be extreme generals as a species across states and as individuals as well. The um, majority of the differences in their diet, I mean, in their um, foraging behavior, were due to the location of their dives. Um, so, this is one of the few studies that has been able to incorporate the diet and behavior of a Predator over the entirety of their range and over a um, long multi year time period. Um, behavior, um, foraging behavior is very mostly due to where they were foraging and not what an individual was doing, and it matches uh, patterns of being cycled based on the spatial distribution of prey both horizontally. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my amazing committee as without his support, I never would have been able to make it through the last few months. And their extreme patience with me asking some questions over and over again. Dan, you have been an amazing advisor, especially this last year when kind of everything hit the fan and I had to start all over from scratch because we found out modeling was wrong, and then the answer completely changed from, yes, elephant seals are specialists, to, oh, no, they're not specialists at all. So, um, this year has been, and especially the last few months, have been just probably some of the craziest in my entire life, and I couldn't have done it without my community. They've been incredibly supportive. Elliot couldn't be here today, and hopefully Rafe is watching over the YouTube connection. So, um, I want to thank the Fossil Lab, both past and present. You guys are an amazing group of people. I've had some of the most incredible experiences being a member of this lab, working in the field with you, Sarah, and um, some of the craziness that we went through going out, thinking it was a good idea to start looking for fields to um, tag. Um, uh, just for spatial, uh, for statistical questions, for just being able to run questions by you guys on, on um, almost anything under the sun, I would never have been able to do it without all of your support. And I really appreciate it. And thank you guys so much for hearing me throughout all of this. Um, my home committee, I must um, that some people that are not here that I wanted to thank specifically, Sarah, <laughs> Sue Budge, Bill Walker, um, who Dan mentioned, who was our expert in all fish and squid mesoplasmic. He was instrumental in getting this study done. As Melinda Collins and I have been made, made this contact, I don't think this research would have taken place. He is a he can look at two, three species that look exactly the same and know exactly what they are without even checking the office. 
Um, I want to thank my mom and dad. My dad passed away right before I started my PhD journey. In fact, a few months before I moved out here to die. And um, he wanted more than anything for me to be able to um, do this work. And he gave me the opportunity to go back to school and completely change where I was going in my life. And I um, really wish you could be here to see this. And then, Mom, there are no words. <laughs> um, you have been my rock throughout this entire process. I, I, I would have reached the end of that. You can't talk me off the ledge. Stephen Bograd, who um, is the oceanographer down at NOAA, who works with Elliot, has been really instrumental in, in helping me kind of work, uh, helping Elliot and I and, and think about the oceanographics of what's been going on in the system and has sat in on a lot of our meetings and almost been honorary. Some ways. Uh, Tim Tinker, who has disappeared off the face of the earth, but before he moved to Halifax, he was incredibly important in helping us figure out how to do the specialization analysis for the elephant field with the unique um, data set that he had and trying to think through how we get the statistics to work with them. Um, Terry Williams, who is out playing the summer balls, I think. Um, has also been just incredibly supportive. And then Mike Peterson, who pretty much a member of the lab, but um, I wanted to thank him as well. Um, I have to do a special thank you to Mel Connor. She has been my partner in crime throughout this entire fatty acid journey. She was she was with me and was like, oh, you want to do fatty acids on elephants? You know, I'm doing them on albatrosses. Let's go do it together. And we went and did everything together. We were practically joint assistant for a year while we collected samples, went and had them identified, shipped them across the country like three different times, went to Halifax and were there for three and a half months processing hundreds and hundreds of fish samples. And then every step of the way through figuring out the analysis for both of our studies, she has been. An incredibly amazing person and just a great client to work with. And then all of my friends, especially Kara and Rachel Fisher, who have supported me, especially in the last few months here, and have just kept me with my nose to my the grindstone and just pushing forward so that I can get this done and, and finally get finished. Not that I don't love you guys and don't want to stay here forever, but. <laughs> Um, it's been a long journey, and I just, I, I really can't express in words how much all of this work has meant to me. And so, I also wanted to um, thank my funding sources, especially NSF and people like that. I, as Dan said, I would have been at UC Davis, actually, <laughs> um, uh, instead of here if I had gotten the NSF probably. Sorry, fish people or surgeon people. Not nearly as cool as the deep diving northern elephant people. So, any questions? <laughs> actually a species that was not included in 
not Prairie Library, unfortunately. And it does get very large, much larger than a lot of the other species in the deep library, uh, deep gathering layers. And um, so it's possible, but I can't say from our data and, and this particular study. However, for the um, all of the prey species that we analyze using fatty acids, we also have stable isotope data for. And we actually do have stable isotope data for that large species. I forget what it's called now. But, um, and so we'll actually, when we um, run the stable isotope analysis, um, to look at diet using that biochemical method, I specifically want to see if that species comes up with diet. Thank <laughs> you. 